Kaczynski. I will now begin today's session with a brief introduction. Welcome everyone to the IEA Bioenergy Webinar Series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. My name is Ronnie Huang and I will be moderating today's session. Today is January 25th, 2017 and we are very pleased to have Lee Lawrence and James McMillan who will give a presentation on Algae Bioenergy State of Technology Review. To start things off, Dr. Lee Lawrence is a senior research scientist in the Bioprocess Research and Development Group at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, primarily responsible for research in analytical biochemistry. She has over 15 years of experience in biotechnology applied to plants, algae, and microbial organisms with a focus on bioenergy. She has worked in national laboratories as well as in academic and industrial environments covering algae and plant biochemistry, cell biomass conversion and characterization, techno-economic analysis, and biotechnology. She leads multiple projects on characterization and conversion and holds a leadership position within the ATP3 network and the establishment of the standardized methods in the algal biofuel sector. Dr. Lawrence is currently the chair of the Algae Biomass Organization's Technical Standards Committee where she leads the development of the guidance document for industrial algae measurements for biomass, bioproducts, and biofuels development from algae. Dr. James D. McMillan is Chief Engineer for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's Bioenergy Center. He has over 25 years research experience advancing lignocellulose biorefining science and technology and is an active contributor to NREL's portion of the United States Department of Energy's Biomass Program. Jim also co-leads IEA Bioenergy Task 39, which is focused on accelerating development and commercialization of of liquid biofuels. Jim obtained his bachelor's in chemical engineering with high distinction from Colorado State University and his master's in chemical engineering practice and PhD in biochemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. With that, I will pass it along to Jim to start off the presentation. Welcome everyone. I uh, want to welcome you to this uh, State of Technology Review on Algae Bioenergy. As Ronnie mentioned, this was the Task uh, 39-led Intertask Strategic Project of IEA Bioenergy. And to just uh, start things off, I wanted to introduce Task 39. Um, IEA Bioenergy Task 39 is focused on facilitating commercialization of conventional and particularly advanced liquid biofuels. It's an international collaboration uh, between 14 countries or entities. Um, the European Commission is one of these, uh, so not exactly a country. Uh, we, uh, as, as this slide shows, uh, span technology and commercialization, as well as policy, markets, sustainability, and implementation issues. Uh, really uh, crossing both the technical and policy divide, if you will, since they need to operate synergy, synergistically. Uh, we do a lot to disseminate information. Uh, we've recently completed this, uh, this project uh, to assess the state of the art of algae uh, bioenergy production. And so that's been one of our big efforts. It was, uh, this effort was done with a number of other tasks, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this just shows the uh, 14 member countries that participate and the, uh, the leadership within those countries. Um, we're, we're quite blessed to be one of the larger tasks. There's about 10 tasks in IEA Bioenergy and we're, we're one of the larger ones and we're really blessed to have strong representation from uh, most areas of the planet. So we've got uh, significant participation in Europe as you can see in the sort of upper list there, uh, North America, uh, Asia, and as well as uh, below the equator, we've got uh, four members, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. So really covering the Oceania area, North America, Europe, uh, uh, and, um, you know, significant global coverage. We are working to uh, increase uh, participation from China and India 
uh, but these, this is uh, our representation right now, excuse me. Um, so as I said, this was an intertask strategic <laughs> project. The focus was to uh, update a 2010 report that Task 39 had written on the status and prospects of algae-based liquid biofuels. So that was only a liquid biofuels focus. And with the uh, advances in algae technology uh, that have gone on since 2010, uh, we wanted to broaden the scope to include additional dimensionalities beyond liquid biofuels um, and including macroalgae, thermochemical pathways, and, and really looking at algae in a biorefinery context and, and exploring economic uh, and sustainability uh, life cycle analysis sort of uh, dimensions of algae bioenergy production. It was a collaboration between uh, these five tasks shown here, task 34, 37, 38, 39, and 42. Uh, Dr. Lee Lawrence uh, from NREL, my colleague, uh, graciously led this project, a very significant effort, and you'll be hearing from her shortly. Uh, but this is quite a substantial um, update, uh, literature review and synthesis. It's, it's 158 pages over 475 references and includes uh, extensive summary of global research operations, uh, summarizing over 400 companies focused on commercial applications uh, in the appendices. Um, it's undergone extensive peer review through, uh, that, through uh, experts in, in algae, uh, in various dimensions of algae production and uh, valorization. Uh, over 450 comments were addressed and the final version will be published in a few days, we're just completing final proofing of it right now. So with that background, I'd like to turn it over to Neva for the bulk of the presentation. I will come back in and talk briefly about macroalgae mm -hmm. uh, in some of the penultimate slides. Mm -hmm. So with that, I turn it over to Neva. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for the introduction. Um, it, is my, it is my honor to present this, this report, and, and I definitely want to um, acknowledge all the co-authors because I am presenting on, on behalf of all my co-authors and everybody's listed. The primary co-authors are listed on slide five and we have our colleagues here at NREL, Melody and, and Jim, Melody, Jim Glasser and Jim McMillan have been um, pretty substantial contributors um, in this effort and then um, we have as Jim was mentioning uh, global support um, David Chiaramonti, Bernhard Droz, Doug Elliott, Maria Barbosa, Jerry Murphy, Judith and Joran um, in Norway, Annette Cowie, and Alison Gauteng and others um, on task 38 and Dina uh, have been all been absolutely instrumental in uh, getting this report together. Okay. I just want to go over briefly over this um, state of technology review and the structure of this report. Um, so as Jim was mentioning, it's going to be made available pretty soon um, in the next couple of days. And basically what you'll see is this report is made up of, made up of uh, 12 individual chapters, um, basically covering international activities, um, uh, technology routes, biochemical processes and, and thermochemical processes, as well as biorefineries and bioproducts. Um, and then we, we also dig into um, the literature and the available um, state of technology on techno-economic analysis, sustainability, and life cycle analysis. And then we really do um, expand from um, previous reports on including biogas from macroalgae, and Jim will um, present some of those works. Um, we have added um, two appendices that um, we wanted to include, and the first is sort of suggest standard LCA um, input metrics and not just LCA but more sort of uh, descriptive parameters that, that we would suggest to really help the technology move forward. And then um, a final appendix that really has um, that subset of 400 individual um, commercial and research operations summarized. So it is a pretty significant report and, um, and I hope it really serves the industry well. Um, so to delve right in, um, I will take some of the key messages from the report and 
um, summarizes in a single slide, and it is it has been a challenge to condense 158 pages into 10 slides, so please bear with me. Um, so basically what set the stage for this report was the, uh, the global fuel use and, and petrochemical markets and the um, Energy Information Agency published the Energy Outlook and um, they updated this um, frequently and the September 2016 version really shows um, projected outwards um, that ultimately the world's production is going to be surpassed by the world's consumption of petroleum crude and that really sets the, um, some of the background as to why um, we are really looking into <coughs> alternative sources and alternative supplies of bioenergy. And along with the production consumption um, challenge, we also noticed in the past couple of years the ongoing decline in petroleum and natural gas prices, which was coupled with um, and then a lack of carbon prices, global carbon prices, which are together very challenging. Um, for um, even algae routes and, and any bioenergy routes to be cost competitive um, for just the production of liquid fuels um, and other bioenergy products. So sort of if you look back and think the macroeconomic conditions will really um, initially in the, in the short term prohibit the economically viable fuel production from algae. And that is sort of setting the stage like we do absolutely have to address um, the supply demand um, of petroleum crude and petrochemical markets, but on the other hand, um, there's a pretty significant um, challenge um, in making the economics work for just the fuel application. So, as we've mentioned, the global industrial development of algae technologies have been expanding rapidly um, in the past six years. And a lot of the applications that that are being commercialized, so that are being researched are mostly for non-fuel or energy products. And those are really commercialized because they provide near-term opportunities. Um, however, bioenergy in a biorefinery context um, where products are being produced alongside, say, a fuel or a bioenergy stream um, is being developed, um, but is more categorized as a research um, environment. In a research environment, um, there's also been an increased competition for algal product um, markets and suitable land for siting these facilities. So, th so that is an ongoing um, sort of um, challenge in, in a lot of these um, deployment scenarios. Um, what I have here on this slide is two screenshots of what the, um, what the summary of the commercial and, and the research operations uh, tables look like at the end of the report, so um, we have tried to summarize, and, and granted a lot of these um, tables are not complete. Um, they are um, summarizing what we could find um, through collaborations, through um, knowledge of different trade organizations, but at the same time, um, we did a lot of searches online. So um, this is currently the, the 400 um, most prominent um, operations. Right. Okay, and this is a summary of these um, operations, commercial and research operations, really working towards commodity-based um, products globally. And what we've done in the report is we separated by regions. So we have uh, groups in Europe, North America, Asia, Oceania, and, uh, and in the Middle East. And we've separated um, each of these um, operations by commercial or research operations, and then within the commercial groups, um, we have um, different cultivation scenarios, so um, photobioreactors or raceways or even combined cultivation systems as well as um, heterotrophic groups. Um, and of course there's a large number of the groups where um, we did find some information online but not enough to really um, ultimately categorize them. So those are then um, listed as the unknown cultivation um, method here. And then there's a group that are suppliers that either produce photobioreactor or produce materials to really enable um, the cultivation groups. The research projects um, that are listed, so the total of 94 research projects um, that were listed, some are actually summarized in the first, um, in the second chapter of the report. 
And those research projects really are limited to the larger, more collaborative consortia um, that are um, placed and that we could find information on. So some of the smaller um, single principal investigator projects are not necessarily linked. But this is really to, to represent sort of the, um, the government public-private um, partnership um, in the different regions uh, around the world. And then we did include information where we did find um, information on operations, but they were now um, out of business um, or closed out um, projects. So for each of these operations, we did place them um, on a map to kind of show the, um, the global representation. And again, I have to say that this is um, based on the information that we have, but you can definitely see regions, um, for example, if you look at France, you definitely see regions in the south of France that are really dominated um, by some commercial installations, and a lot of these are, are the spirulina growers um, in France, in the south of France. And then in the rest of Europe, you do see a nice um, distribution of both um, research operations, which are shown in the green pins, um, and commercial operations that are split. Same thing within the United States um, and in Asia. Um, you do see a nice distribution of, of commercial and research operations um, nicely represented um, globally. Um, so yeah, so basically what this um, what this shows is that there is um, a many there are many partnerships of government and industry groups that really are still supporting that early R and D. Um, so it's really rapidly expanding. Um, rapidly expanding. Okay. So <clears throat> the report really starts off with giving some background on, um, on algae productivity. So algae still exhibit um, high photosynthetic efficiency and they um, are estimated to produce about 55 tons, um, metric tons per hectare per year. And that is roughly twice that of productive terrestrial plants. Um, and based on this, they Algae do remain an attractive target for bioenergy and large deployment applications. However, algae are also um, resource intensive. So the resources such as land, water, and sunlight, and also nutrients, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus do remain key issues. And we'll delve into those um, in a little bit more detail later. And algae cultivation can really um, take many forms. And, and what is shown is some flat panel photobioreactors outside um, you know, indoor and outdoor at Arizona um, State University. Um, a lot of research is going on in small open ponds or even in um, um, tubular photobioreactors. And at the bottom of the um, of slide 11, I'm actually showing a Google Maps image of the cyanotech facilities in Hawaii to just illustrate the scale at which some of these algae facilities are being deployed um, out in the commercial sphere. So if we move forward and we delve a little bit into the, um, in the photosynthetic um, conversion efficiency um, aspect. So what I'm showing here on the, um, on the graph is a, um, a, stepwise, a stepwise loss in, in energy uh, during photosynthetic assimilation of inorganic carbon. So if you start with solar radiation, about 12% of the available solar radiation energy is being reduced, um, reduced carbohydrates in the cells. And that is um, sort of a theoretical calculation of what can possibly be, um, be assimilated. So this 12% theoretical efficiency on solar radiation um, is definitely feasible. However, most of the observed efficiency and, and losses are mostly due to, um, to respiration and, and overall inefficiency. Um, are more in the range of 2 to 3 percent. So there is pretty significant potential to further improve this um, and really maximize, um, maximize the taking advantage of the um, solar radiation. Growth rates are reported in the 10 to 30 grams per square meter per day range, um, which is highly dependent on location and the cultivation system. And realistic oil contents are reported of between 12 and 20 percent um, of the biomass. However, what a lot of researchers are noticing um, recently is that the oil and biomass productivity do exhibit an inverse relationship, and that specific inverse relationship is the main target of a lot of strain engineering um, to increase biofuel yields. Um, is can you 
actually produce higher oil content while not taking a um, penalty on the growth rate. And some of those strain engineering efforts are summarized in the report, um, if anyone is interested. What I'm showing at the bottom left is the, um, the approximate research, uh, resource input to produce about one kilogram of an algae-based fuel. Um, and this information is presented, sort of the um, assumptions going into that. So what we're seeing here is to produce one kilogram of fuel, you need about five kilograms of biomass. And in order to produce that biomass, you need about 300 square meters of land um, per day um, to produce this, but also about 5,000 liters of water and a 10 kilograms of CO2, um, along with <coughs> 0.34 kilograms of nitrogen and 0.07 kilograms of phosphorus. So um, algae cultivation, in summary, is, is extremely resource intensive and will require extensive recycling um, of nutrients post extraction or conversion or potentially co-locating um, with wastewater facilities um, to minimize um, the renewed input of these nutrients. So <coughs> we mentioned the number of times um, conversion technologies and I have to say that there are hundreds of permutations that are um, published and, and pretty much every month there's new permutations of process operations that are published in the literature. But basically um, most of what is published and what is described in the literature can be summarized um, in this figure that I'm showing up here um, with different unit operations that are um, included or slotted in at different points. So basically um, any cultivation system starts with um, the addition of carbon dioxide, nutrients, and, and water into a cultivation system. And this can be an open pond system or a photobioreactor system, after which the algae would be harvested. In this particular case, and this doesn't always have to be um, this way, a flocculant is added and, and dissolved air flotation really helps with the, um, the centrifugation and the harvesting of the biomass. Um, but again, there's different um, options that are possible here up front. Then the biomass slurry enters into an extraction system, um, into an extraction system. But again, this, there's many permutations as to what could precede that extraction system, and there's many permutations as to what can follow um, an extraction. But basically, oftentimes it involves a, um, a solvent-based extraction system um, for a lipid extraction process, after which the solvent is recovered. The lipids enter into a distillation or an upgrading pathway to for example, naphtha diesel and jet, but also biodiesel um, production. The residue, which would presumably contain most of the carbohydrates and the protein, um, is relegated to an anaerobic digester, which then allows us to um, recycle the majority of the water, um, the water and the nutrients um, back to the pond. While the anaerobic digestion provides a um, pretty significant amount of um, biogas, which then helps to actually power part of the plant. Um, and as I said, these, um, there are many permutations, but at the same time, you can sort of start to categorize um, the processing or the conversion technologies into three major categories. And one is the lipid-only, lipids-only pathway, which pretty much follows um, the route that I've described just now. And then the second would be a whole algal biomass is sort of a non-destructive fractionation process, which I'll talk about in a second. And then there's, um, there's a lot of interest recently in the thermochemical hydrothermal liquefaction pathway, um, which also um, has been described pretty extensively in the literature um, and is also sort of a main um, conversion technology for this entire biomass stream. <coughs> Just to take a step back and talk a little bit about this fractionation pathway, so the second um, uh, second category of conversion. So where it differs from the lipid extraction only is that the, the biomass after harvesting um, is subjected to a pretreatment um, process. And this can be a dilute acid pretreatment. Um, in the case of a combined algal processing recently published um, pathway, this includes a dilute acid pretreatment of the algal biomass slurry. Um, the slurry is typically about 15 to 20 percent solid. And this generates a sugar stream um, from the carbohydrates and at the same time makes the lipids um, more extractable um, at the same time. So the sugar stream 
typically enters into um, a fermentation pathway. So in this case, it was drawn into um, a typical yeast fermentation to produce ethanol. After fermentation, the residue is being um, harvested and used for extraction. The solvent is recovered, and the residue that is um, protein-rich is again sent into an anaerobic digester. Um, but at the same time, there's options for that protein-rich residue um, to even um, produce additional fuel alcohols. Um, again, whatever happens to that residue, um, water and nutrient recycle at this final step is absolutely critical in order to, um, to render the entire process um, sustainable. So after extraction, the solvent is recovered, and again, the oil, the crude oil, is sent into an upgrading um, to NASA diesel jets or even bi-diesel um, production. The hydrothermal liquefaction pathway, again, follows a similar um, harvesting process, again, to 15 to 25 percent um, slurry. And then instead of a pretreatment process, the biomass enters into a hot reactor, um, typically between um, 300 and 350 degrees centigrade, um, high temperature, high pressure, after which um, a aqueous Basically, a biocrude slurry is being produced, and that can be separated into an aqueous, a biocrude, um, and solid phases. Um, those can be separated. And again, after this initial solid liquid separation of that biocrude material, the biocrude can be entered into an upgrading pathway, and again, the water phase entered into a catalytic hydrothermal um, gasification. Um, which then allows, again, for a nutrient recycle. And again, nutrients can be recycled after this initial solid liquid, um, um, solid liquid separation. Some of the literature does talk about the addition of a biomass pretreatment, which can really help, such as the conversion pH or catalysts that are included in this initial uh, reactor vessel can really impact the yield and the quality of the biocrude. Um, in addition, the biocrude yield can actually be pretty dependent on the biochemical makeup of the cells, um, for example, the non-lipid components, and that's really one of the advantages um, of a hydrothermal liquefaction or HDL. The, the non-lipid components can really add still to the yield um, about 5 to 25 percent um, approximately. Um, and actually, there has been um, some literature on using actually um, using some of the aqueous phase in the loop form as a source of nutrients for recycling um, um, to microbial growth or even actually returning the, in the dilute form back to the pond. So then we, um, we did include biogas production from microalgae as another conversion. So we do have that as a sort of a conversion um, process in there. And what I'm showing on this slide is um, there's, there's significant literature here on anaerobic digestion of microalgae that has been um, demonstrated with both whole biomass but also with residue after extraction. And what we're showing here is a number of species with um, the biogas production is in um, liters per kilogram volatile solids. You really see an up to twofold um, range in yield that is highly dependent on the biomass composition. And also within the biogas, the methane content can vary. So something to keep in mind that the biomass pretreatment may be necessary to both maximize the biogas yield, but also maximize the methane um, content in the biogas. There are challenges, even though we always slot in anaerobic digestion at the back end of um, any um, lipid extraction or conversion process, there may be challenges with this post-extraction anaerobic digestion. And that could be attributed to um, ensuring the bioavailability of the carbon, um, especially because um, by removing the lipids and in um, some of the con um, combined algal processing, the CAP process, we're actually removing a lot of the carbohydrates as well. So the nitrogen to carbon ratio of that residue is actually changing quite a bit. And that could provide challenges um, to this post-extraction anaerobic digestion. And that is something that is actually under um, active investigation in the literature right now. So to take a step back into, um, we'll delve into the economics in a minute, but um, because we're seeing the commercial operations sort of shift away from fuels and more into bioproducts, we um, actually dedicated an entire chapter to looking into the biorefineries and bioproducts um, from algae. 
Um, we summarized a lot of the recent technology developments um, that really use all of the algal biomass components. So again, looking at a conversion process, for example, that would give you that fractionation, that give you um, access in a non-destructive manner, give you access to all different components in the, in the biomass, um, may really help with the economics, may also help with um, addressing some of the challenges um, uh, on, on the bioenergy implementation, if you will. Um, and that is something that we have seen is that both in the academic literature and, and as I said in the companies um, in the commercial environment is that algal based um, algae production in general is no longer focused on only looking at the lipid fraction and that is something that we're, um, we're summarizing here. So what I'm showing in the table here on the right is that the different components that are present in the biomass um, from you know, even components that are present at about 1% to components that are present to up to 45%, such as fermentable sugars, really have a variety of different applications. And I just wanted to highlight, for example, the omega-3 fatty acids, which are extremely valuable as nutraceuticals, um, but command a relatively small market size, um, whereas those same polyunsaturated fatty acids can enter into polyol polyurethane, um, um, markets which suddenly command um, an 11 and above, you know, and up to in the millions of tons per year market. So, so this this sort of um, market size and the composition of the products needs to be aligned when algae farms are really scaled to over about 2,000 hectares, because then you start producing um, in the range of 100,000 tons of biomass per year um, and higher. Um, so some of these products that could be, you know, from one farm could end up swamping a market size. So that is something that is under active investigation. We're starting to look into this, um, and especially at the scales of once you start to think about bioenergy applications at those scales, you really have to think about farm size um, and market size for the product. Now, one very large market application is to use um, algae as feed supplements, and these are, again, um, um, some areas that are under active investigation and it's something that we've looked into is to the market size of a total feed um, and there is absolutely a global um, an enormous um, global market of almost 1 billion tons metric tons um, per year and that's separated um, by um, by different applications so poultry pig ruminant or even aquaculture um, all command relatively high market um, and um, algae can definitely make up a certain percentage of, of these markets. But again, um, in order to, to enter, um, a lot more research needs to be done on the, um, a lot more research needs to be um, done and published on the implementation of um, algae as, as feed supplements and, and just make sure that, um, that they are a like-for-like -like placement. So there are um, sort of when you take a step back and you look at the large um, overall um, sustainability aspect of, of algae, there are sustainability considerations that have to be taken into account. And uh, the National Academies of Sciences in, in 2012 um, published a pretty extensive report. And here's some of the, um, the summarizing thoughts um, from that report and it's something that, um, that we also highlight and we do address in, in um, some of the chapters in this report. So in principle, the quantity of the water, um, whether fresh or saline water is required for algae cultivation um, and to really, um, the water chemistry really needs to be taken into account. The supply of the key nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon dioxide needs to be um, not impacting global supply. Um, land use, but appropriate land area um, with climate and slope and um, water and nutrient sources is a really <coughs> important consideration for, um, for large-scale deployment. And then ultimately, um, when we start thinking of, of bioenergy, so the energy return on investment and the production um, of, of algae and whatever conversion process and the, um, the energy content of the different products that are being produced, um, really has to provide sufficiently more energy than is required um, on the front end. So um, this energy return on investment becomes a very crucial point um, ultimately in the, um, in the scale of, of um, algae technology. 
and ultimately along with the energy return and investment, the greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of algae biofuels um, will have to produce um, a greenhouse benefit relative to other um, options such as fossil fuels. And this is something that we'll talk to in a minute. <clears throat> and there are, of course, economic drivers um, behind the um, algae cultivation. And once we start to look into the literature, um, we did notice that the single biggest barrier to market deployment still is the high cost of cultivation and harvesting the algal biomass. And that is sort of summarized in the pie charts up here on the left. We have, mm, I mean, these are from a pretty old report, but still a lot of these um, um, underlying assumptions are still valid, maybe not the, the actual ultimate the absolute numbers, but the distribution of the costs associated on the left here with the photobioreactor system is that the majority of your installed capital cost really is associated with um, constructing the um, cultivation system, whereas with the uh, palms, um, it's about a threefold less upfront investment in the capital system. However, there's still a pretty significant um, aspect associated with just setting up um, and, and installing your cultivation system. Um, that alongside relatively low outdoor productivities really challenge the economics. Um, what I'm presenting here um, on the graph, and that's from a recent reference um, that we've included in the report, which sort of gives a nice overview of what's published in the literature um, back to 1996 um, to very recently, there's an over tenfold range in, in reported biofuel costs. So um, these techno-economic assessments um, that are published in the literature absolutely vary on the assumptions and the methodologies used. So in order to, to overcome these challenges in, econo in, in, in building a good understanding of what are the economic drivers um, to make um, this algae bioenergy a reality in the future, there are two main challenges that need to be overcome, and that's really one is sort of harmonization and standardizing of the assumptions and the methodologies, um, as well as um, providing access or, or making um, pilot and demonstration experimental data accessible um, to different um, groups. Um, this is a similar, so the next slide really gives us a similar um, overview. Um, however, this is one TEA model that, that is applied to algae productivity at six different locations, which still shows um, about a threefold range in estimated cost of production. Um, and this is uh, presented as uh, different scenarios and, and, and projections, so anything from raceways uh, to different photobioreactors um, across, across the world from the Netherlands um, all the way up to Curaçao. Um, and this, this range of production is primarily driven then by um, geographical location and less so by the assumptions that go into the model, um, but still gives you um, a pretty significant range in cost. But still, these costs and costs that are recently um, published um, in the United States as well, um, all of these projected costs are about six to tenfold higher than what is considered economically viable still for a fuel production pathway. And then once we start to look <coughs> at the, um, the sustainability considerations, again, so the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions um, from algae, we see a, a similar uh, range in reported, um, uh, in reported emissions per megajoule of biofuel produced. Um, so this is a group um, who worked with an, Annette Cowie, really looks at the literature of um, the reported CO2 emissions per megajoule um, biofuel, and it ranges from um, from negative um, 2.6 to about um, 7.3 kilograms of CO2 per megajoule. So again, there's a lot of um, variability that is reported in the literature, and it's very hard to draw ultimate and absolute conclusions um, from from a lot of these reports. But what was interesting is that there was um, some pretty significant trends that could be attributed to the different um, processing conditions. So that is definitely something that is under current um, further investigation. Um, okay. And then this is a zoom in of that region of um, the very small region. And it's actually overlaid of the reported um, 
emissions relative to biofuel production is reported um, it's overlaid relative to the um, the GHG intensity of fossil diesel and you can see in some of the scenarios that are being um, reported um, where the, um, the the carbon intensity if you will of algae operations is less than the carbon intensity of fossil diesel and those are definitely um, scenarios in which um, the sustainability of a algae operation would absolutely be um, critical and would be feasible um, to continue to work on. Um, and in addition to um, sustainability considerations, there's also the resource assessment and availability um, that we've discussed in this report. Um, and that really needs to be integrated um, within the food, energy, and water network. And there's a lot of literature um, that is recently being published in this area. Um, and especially where the major conclusions are is that algae do have the potential to influence the energy portfolio globally. And that's sort of the um, reference B80 here, um, the image that I'm showing here, is algae do have that potential to influence this energy portfolio globally, but that is assuming that water and nutrients and CO2 are not limiting. Um, however, t taking this into account, we do have to sort of consider land use change, um, direct and indirect, and some of those emissions um, that are associated um, with, with land use change, and these have received very little attention in the literature, and this needs to be integrated in the overall sustainability um, modeling scenario. Okay. So we talk a little bit in the report about the carbon dioxide valorization potential, because algae are um, high biomass producers, they are um, by assumption and by um, containing about 50% carbon in the biomass, there's pretty significant potential um, to use and, and assimilate carbon dioxide and be co-located with um, carbon dioxide producers. Um, this is not something that, that we've, we've analyzed ourselves. We've taken a lot of information from the recently published billion ton studies, so um, I just want to highlight some of those conclusions here that um, just for the United States, there's um, about 3.3 billion tons of CO2 available from different point sources. So if you integrate, if you were to integrate that with an algae production scenario, there's about 86 million metric tons of biomass that could be um, produced, um, or could be at least uh, using that carbon dioxide on about 7,000 square kilometers um, of algae farms. Um, so there's definitely pretty significant potential um, for carbon valorization um, using algae. And I just want to hand it over to, to Jim, who's been more intimately involved with the macroalgae proportion um, of this report. So, Jim. All right. Um, well, the, so macroalgae was another dimension covered in the report. And uh, as, as, as larger plants, if you will, than microalgae, their, their um, productivity is, is somewhat less. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of the attributes that we've heard about from microalgae, high photosynthetic efficiency, the ability to provide an additional um, resource for bioenergy production, um, uh, the, the ability to produce a variety of, of products in addition to bioenergy, a lot of these things hold also for macroalgae. However, uh, macroalgae is a relatively new area of investigation. Most of the uh, work is still in the early stage. It's, it's at least five to ten years behind um, microalgae research. Um, there are some, some um, projects that have been announced that are targeting things like liquid fuels and seeing what can be done with macroalgae, but none of they're, they're um, in early stages now, so there's really not a lot to report uh, in terms of findings yet, uh, as it remains a, a new area of investigation and a lot needs to be uh, identified. Nonetheless, there's a, humans have a, a long experience with macroalgae. Macroalgae is, is cultivated as a food and feed source. Um, it's used to produce things like carrageenan and, and auger and so forth. I mean, so we, we're, we're familiar with this resource. And in, in coastal regions where it's, uh, it's abundant, uh, it, it provides something that we should look at. Um, in the interest of time, um, I, will, I will just uh, go to the next slide if I can and uh, just summarize briefly some of the, the issues. I, I think from a, 
the attributes are similar, but the major difference is in the collection, the logistics of the macroalgae resource. So um, you have both cast, which would be collected off the beach uh, after a storm event or just routinely because of the type of algae, uh, the type of microalgae or seaweed. Um, but that would be an intermittent, if it was cast, it would be an intermittent supply versus a dedicated cultivated macroalgae. And, and uh, one, one way this is being done is in conjunction with aquaculture to avoid uh, additional nutrient runoff into the larger ocean, put macroalgae around aquaculture installations to basically like a wastewater uh, utilization scheme where you can use those runoff nutrients uh, and provide environmental services to the rest of the ocean, not getting them out there and causing uh, a, a detrimental blooms and things like that in the larger ocean, but productively growing a biomass resource. So the, uh, as this slide shows in the upper panel, um, one of the big challenges is we, we know there's the diurnal and the seasonal uh, attributes of compositional differences in algae and microalgae, similar holds for macroalgae. And you can see this is uh, showing over the course of the year, January through December, the uh, composition of total solids on the left-hand side, the, the C to N ratio uh, is this dashed line uh, running sort of through the middle. If you can see that, it's a little faint. Uh, but what you can see is the carbohydrate function, uh, fraction and the, um, and the C to N ratio kind of go hand in hand. And uh, the lower graph shows the specific methane yield potential. And I, biogas has been the most investigated product from macroalgae. So that's, that has a, a full chapter of focus in, in the report. And what you can see is it depends a lot uh, if you, if you want to see how much methane you could recover when you would be harvesting this algae. And, you know, in the northern hemisphere, I believe this, this data is from the northern hemisphere, and, and in the late summer, early autumn sort of time frame, uh, it's when you see maximal production. So how would you be supplying um, the second bullet here on the right-hand side? You know, if you were having cat seaweed, a lot of this would not be that productive um, in terms of if you're collecting it all year round. It wouldn't be ideal for maximizing methane potential per kilogram of, of biomass. Um, so, uh, you know, one opportunity would be to co-locate where you brought in additional dedicated macroalgae production um, or uh, terrestrial biomass to supplement uh, the production. If you're making biogas, the advantage would be uh, no matter how much you make, you could upgrade this and inject it into a, a gas pipeline so that it would be supplementing, but it wouldn't be the only supply, uh, and so it would be really topping off that pipeline, and that might be an effective way of, uh, of implementing uh, macroalgae in the near term. So um, I think in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that, and we'll, we'll get to the penultimate slides. I'll turn it back to, to Lisa here. Okay. Well, this just brings us to the conclusions of um, the conclusions of the of the report, and it's really um, you know summarizing that this um, this report is now um, complete. We consider this a 2017 um, state of technology review on algae bioenergy. Um, it will be published in the next week. It will be available on both the IEA Bioenergy and the TAC 39 websites. Um, so please keep an eye out um, for the publication. Um, and basically, to, to just reiterate um, three major points of, of what we've um, talked about today and then what we talk about in the report, is that algae do remain a very promising source of bioenergy um, thanks to their high photosynthetic efficiency. But, but prospects for making economically um, conscious decisions around um, energy and fuels production um, some of those prospects are poor in the near term um, because of the, the high cost of growing and harvesting biomass. Um, however, there's, there's pretty significant research that is currently ongoing, um, so we're definitely keeping, um, keeping tabs on the literature and, and potentially in the next couple of years we'll, uh, um, we'll update some of our findings. Um, again, a lot of this, these economic decisions are relying on um, the macroeconomic environment and the global macroeconomic environment as well, so the cost of fuels um, globally. The um, algae processing in a biorefinery complex may permit um, uh, 
the co-production of bioenergy with co-products uh, and the integration with a wastewater treatment um, system or stream may actually help with the economics as well. And then ultimately, the last and final point is that there is an urgent need for open data sharing, but also for harmonizing of, of approaches from anything from, um, um, from analytical approaches to cultivation to product isolation, but also to, um, to harmonize how to, you know, tech and economic analysis and life cycle modeling is being carried out. And, and by doing this, by doing this sort of harmonization, we can then ultimately prioritize some of the major barriers that need to be overcome and really drive commercialization. And this is all we have. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy, we are both happy to answer questions. Thanks, Lise uh, and Jim. Um, that was fantastic. So we will now open it up for a question period, so please bear with me while I unmute the lines. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted. So to ask a question over the phone, please state your name, where you are calling from, and then address the question. We will also be bringing up the chat pod to the middle of the screen where you can type in your questions and we can address them one by one. So feel free to type in your questions. So we'll just allow some time for people to type in their questions and we, we see questions being yeah. uh, yep, yep, yep. typed, but uh, <coughs> we don't see them on the screen yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really <laughs> bad. I guess just to reiterate, it's primary production of bioenergy uh, is what we're not seeing as viable with the current macroeconomic conditions. However, co-product bioenergy production in a biorefinery context remains an interesting uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to explore through research. Um, okay, so, so the first question. Yeah. If these yep. Two. We got a couple of questions. The first question: Markets for bio-based products from algae were presented. Was this in dry tons? Yes. 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 Okay. Our second Did question. We consider ocean forest concepts in the report. Um, not extensively. I think that has to. Uh, that that is sort of a subset of the macroalgae. Um, I think it's very much in development. Uh, there wasn't a lot of literature that we mined in that area yet, but it has to do with large-scale macroalgae cultivation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is the net energy balance from a PBR, from a photobioreactor? I guess how, how yeah. th th here's, here we go, devil's in the details, so. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is not an easy question to answer, and I would rather Personally, I would rather take it offline. Um, there is a report, a, com a pretty comprehensive report being compiled right now that is going to be submitted for publication pretty soon where all the photobioreactor, um, both techno-economics and energy um, aspects are being prepared, uh, compared. So um, I'm happy to forward this, so please be in touch. Yeah, so Mr. Singh, you, yeah. could, you could email mm -hmm. Leva uh, Lawrence or, or follow up with with myself, uh, Jim McMillan, we're both mm -hmm. available. If you go to the NREL website, you can pick us up mm -hmm. our emails if you don't have them. Um, and I would also just bring up mm -hmm. that it really, it very much depends on, mm -hmm. you know, what is the location, mm -hmm. what is the product being made, yeah. you know, and what and type of photobioreactor, what are the yeah, yeah. So this, it's it's not a single question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Muta M is asking, what can presently be said? to be the cost of production of microalgae per kilogram of dry product. I think we showed a couple of graphs. <clears throat> we do, and but some of those are, are current state of technology. Um, again, the, the report coming out of the Netherlands places um, algae in the about 10 euros per, <coughs> excuse me, 10 euros per kilogram, so about 10,000 um, euros per ton. Um, there's other reports that are out that are really talking about um, one and a half dollars per kilogram, so about fifteen hundred dollars per ton. Um, and again, it really absolutely it ranges again based on, on production scenario, based on cultivation system, based on assumptions that are made. Um, so yeah, I would say I think we we ultimately settled on anything between five hundred. Um, 
dollars per ton, so about half a do half a dollar per kilogram, to about ten euros or ten dollars per kilogram. And I think the U.S.'s mm -hmm. target is something like a third of the. It's like fifty cents, fifty five cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. Per kilogram um, to be to get into the range of, of cost mm -hmm. competitive for a primary bioenergy production. So mm -hmm. we still have a ways to go there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Right. So there's a few more questions here. The role and impact of <laughs> um, I think it's potentially mm -hmm. quite large. Leva mm -hmm. might say more, but as we mm -hmm. said, the photosynthetic uh, efficiencies being realized mm -hmm. versus the theoretical photosynthetic efficiency would would seem to say that there's quite a significant improvement that can be achieved through mm -hmm. continued uh, genomics research and identifying more efficient mm -hmm. uh, ways to, to leverage the algae more efficiently. There's challenges, though, mm -hmm. certainly. Yes, absolutely. Um, is there a substantial difference on the investment needed in energy versus higher value product unit? Um, if I understand. Yeah, I, well, I think I think there is a substantial yeah. difference. The fuel, the fuel uh, targets or the energy targets are generally you need much larger installations, uh, and and your product value is much less. So it's more challenging mm -hmm. uh, for a higher value product. Usually, it's a smaller market, so the investment, you know, it's a smaller plant uh, that you can that you can right. develop to start making some money. So I would say yeah. there's. There are differences there. There are differences needed when you when you talk scale, for sure, and that's that's a good point. But ultimately, if you can tie in your higher value product um, into into an existing conversion process, you can um, presumably take both. So that would kind of take one um, one route to production of biomass, and you just tie off. Uh, so the biorefinery bio concept. Yeah, the biorefinery concept might actually then um, argue the opposite in saying that. You know, the the biggest investment is going to be needed in the production side, whereas you know some of the downstream conversion is going to be shared. Um, okay, have you considered the conundrum CO2 sources is not close to the areas where um, algae cultivation is needed? Um, absolutely, that is part of a lot of the um, resource assessment calculations, um, and some of those losses, especially in in transferring CO2, um, both the cost and the losses <coughs> in concentration are really taken into account in, in extensive resource assessment. Mm -hmm. Local water resources with exotic algae species. Any large-scale deployment will ultimately um, have to be approved by the by the environment, um, Environmental Protection Agency here and, and its counterparts in Europe. So, um, any or other geographies. Or yeah. any other geographies. <laughs> yeah, but but um, we we didn't go deep on on that uh, mm -hmm. environmental indicator. I think that's a yeah. that is a dimension that would be looked at, but it's secondary relative to having an economically viable mm -hmm. and and macro sustainable process mm -hmm. from the standpoint of CO2, mm -hmm. water, and, and nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not one to, to ignore, but it would Absolutely. It, would it can be a showstopper if, if you don't get it right. Yeah, right, so. absolutely. And that will then relate sort of to the genomics, too, is that the, the metabolically engineered species may not necessarily be, um, um, be allowed to grow outside. So. So comparing between CO2 supply and harvesting, which can be considered more costly in the production of microalgae, I think that it's going to depend on a lot on the location mm -hmm. and the methodology. The harvesting will, you know, always be a challenge, but some some algal species will self-flocculate um, better than others mm -hmm. and and simplify the harvesting. And some sightings will be closer to to a power plant or to an ethanol fermentation facility or something where a, a, a good source of CO2 is available. So it, it, it depends a lot on the location there. Mm -hmm. um, another question, have your economics been offset by the need for reduced water treatment and carbon dioxide capture? Um, I guess the wastewater, I'm not, the, certainly if you can use wastewater and people have have looked at that as a, as a lower cost way of supplying water and nutrients <laughs> um, to the, the 
for algae cultivation, that will definitely help the economics. Uh, mm -hmm. And the fact that you're, I don't know, mm -hmm. that from a CO2 standpoint, you're, you're putting the, you're capturing some of the CO2 in a form that ultimately it's going to be given up. You're just getting further with the produced CO2, if you will. Right, it's a second really valorization of the CO2, but if there was a carbon price on that, if there was a, a particular cost associated with carbon capture, then yes, that would absolutely be part of the economics. It isn't in the economical calculations that I've or, or if you're putting it into a permanent repository. Right, um, right. So uh, we appreciate the nice comment from Sridhar via Mandala. Yeah. Um, uh, Jim, I uh, think we due to time constraint, we'll be taking a few more questions. Just yeah. So I think we'll be okay. wrapping it up shortly. Okay. How yep. much laboratories of biorefining there are in the world? So you can see the summary uh, in the appendix, but there's over 400 uh, mm -hmm. uh, significant uh, efforts. Uh, going on uh, on the commercial side and on the research side, you know, probably mm -hmm. uh, an equal number, uh, you know, quite a few. It, it, the scales vary quite dramatically, but some of that they're is not, summarized. Right. Dependent. They're not all biorefineries, so you'll see in the um, in the final table we actually do talk about what's the focus and what the um, um, what's the general. Uh, purpose of each of the companies, so we can you can there see you know how many are actually implementing biorefinery applications um, versus how many are just producing biomass. So there's there's definitely a discrepancy between the two. And the report will just be a PDF, um, mm -hmm. and that actually facilitates because the appendix is quite quite small. It's, I mean it's 400 companies, so reading it. You'll, you'll benefit from being able to put it on a screen and enlarge it maybe a little yeah. to, uh, yeah. to get all the details. So feel free to contact us too if you need. Um, just to, we can just send the uh, the table out. We can absolutely help out, um, provide information. A couple economics. more economics there. I'll give you the window. Energy PBR, wind process energy. Okay, actually that's something, um, Linda Higgins. Um, that is something that we did not consider in this report, um, but it is a very interesting approach. Is where you end up um, providing a lot of the energy. Um, to run the facility by um, other renewable sources. Yeah, so, so the cost of the uh, yeah. the cost of the mm -hmm. energy and the life cycle impacts would certainly be favorably mm -hmm. uh, right. Might be favorably impacted if you don't have to pay for the yeah. the installation. Definitely. One thing with solar, because people have, have introduced solar as an energy source to run um, the algae facility, but then you're ultimately demanding for the same <coughs> amount of land. So there's only so much land area that you can, you know. That's suitable. Yeah, right, right, right. So, um, okay. Well, thank, well, thank we'll you all for your attendance and uh, for your good questions and engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward yep. to uh, getting feedback on the report uh, shortly as, a, as it's made available and you can look at it. Mm -hmm. And please send us questions by email too, absolutely. Yep. So then um, I, due to time constraints, I would like to bring this session to a close now. So thank you all very much to, for participating in today's webinar. And thank you once again to Leva and Jim for the wonderful presentation. Uh,